Uh, Kola Masi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for our virtual side event for the 20, 2023 United Nations Water Conference. My name is Shannon Holsey, and I am the president of the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohican Indians. And I also serve as the treasurer of the National Congress of American Indians. And today I'll be your moderator of this amazing panel, Restoring Rivers, Restoring Sovereignty. I would also like to take an opportunity to thank the United Nations for uh, the inclusion and providing this platform for tribal nations to share their experiences at this very critical international conference. We have an amazing panel here for you today of tribal leaders, climate activists, and federal officials to discuss, discuss the Klamath River of Southern Oregon and Northern California and the mission of local tribal nations to have four hydroelectric dam dams removed from this body of water. But before we begin, I would like to provide a brief overview of this issue to our audience members who may not be, be very familiar with the region. The Kalamath River and its tributaries have been home to numerous distinct tribal nations of Oregon and California for thousands of years. For, for millennia, the Klamath tribes, the Yurok, Kirok, and the Hoopa Valley tribe have relied upon these waters ways to provide fresh water and yearly salmon runs that have sustained their cultural traditions and foods. In the 1800s, the, as European settlers moved westward to the California region, the Klamath Basin became heavily occupied for the purposes of gold mining, fishing, and farming. In 18, excuse me, in 1918, the first hydroelectric dam, Topco One, was built on the Upper Klamath River. In the following decades, several other drams, dams were built along the river effectively blocking salmon spawning throughout much of the Klamath and its connecting waterways. Since then, the water quality of the Klamath River, River has declined and its salmon population sadly have been critically endangered. In the past 20 years, a movement has begun spearheaded by tribal nations of the region to have these hydroelectric dams removed from the Klamath River. After many years of advocacy by tribal nations, in 2022, the Federal Energy, Energy Regulatory Commission announced this important that the ownership of four dams, include, including uh, COPCO-1, would be transferred from the Pacific Corp Energy Company over to the Klamath River Renewal Corporation. These dams are now slated for removal by the end of 2024. Today, you will be hearing from the following amazing panelists and subject matter experts to discuss the cultural and environmental impacts these dams have had on the Kalamath River and its tributaries and their ongoing efforts the dam, of these dam, towards these dam removals. Um, joining us today, we have Chairman Joseph James of the Yurok Tribe, Honorable James L. James, Joseph L. James from the, Yur the Yurok Tribal Chairman is from the village of Sheragon along the Klamath River in Northern California. Chairman James has worked for tribal governments for the past 23 years in many areas from fisheries to water policy, law, infra infrastructure, protection of tribal resources, economic development, and of course, leadership. He has served as the Yurok Tribes Transportation Manager, as their East District Council Member. He was elected as the Chairman in October of 2018 and the Yurok Economic Development Board President and most recently re-elected as his second term as the Chairman in October of 2021. Also with us today is Chairman Russell or Buster Atterbury of the Kirok Tribe. Russell um, Atterbury is currently serving his 11th year as the um, proud chairman of the Kirok tribe. And some of his highlights as chairman in his um, longstanding career include, he is a 1974 graduate of the Sacramento State University and he holds a Bachelor of Arts degree. And he also through the years of 70, 1976 and 77, um, played professional uh, baseball in Class A Northeast League from the uh, Seattle Rainiers to the Portland Mavericks. He also is the 1981 graduate from Humboldt State University 
and a lifetime clear teaching. He has a lifetime clear teaching credential through the Indian Teacher Education Program. He also served as a Pacific Region Representative for the Tribal Development of Interior Budget, or otherwise known as TIBIC. He's a member at large of the California Tribal Chairman's Association and also a panel member for the Tribal Nations Grant Fund. And also joining us today is Assistant Secretary of the Army Civil of Works, Michael Connor. The Honorable Michael Connor was sworn in as the Assistant Secretary of the Army Civil Works on November 29th of 2021. And he serves as the Principal Advisor to the Secretary of the Army on all matters related to the Army Civil Works program. program. In his role, Michael serves and establishes policy direction and provides supervision of the Department of Army's functions relating to all aspects of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Civil Works Program. These responsibilities include programs for, for conservation and development of the nation's water and wetland resources, flood control, navigation, and shore protection all critically important aspects of the president's climate resilience priorities. And finally joining us today is Danielle Ray Frank from the Save California Salmon. Danielle um, Frank is from the Hoopa tribe and she also is a tribal member with Yurok Ancestry. She is, serves as the youth coordinator for the Sur Save California Salmon and Miss Nate Way of the Hoopa Valley Tribe. She currently studies environmental science with a focus in water policy and looks forward to a future as a tribal scientist in the Klamath Basin. And somebody like Danielle also represents the brain trust of Indian country and somebody who we critically rely on as we move forward in these critical endeavors. So with that said, we're going to get right to it in terms of questions we and just for general housekeeping purposes we have a series of questions for our uh, our amazing panel and if there is an opportunity at the end we will entertain questions and answer a uh, question and answer series but we also ask you to put some of your questions in our chat so first up we have um, chairman Atterbury welcome chairman chairman Atterbury thank you so much for being here today Please, if you could tell us a bit about the Kirok tribe and its relationship to the Klamath River and why is the Klamath River and water so essential to your tribal nation? Yo, thank you. Uh, yeah, um, the Kirok tribe, again, located uh, probably right in the middle of uh, the Klamath River. Uh, we have three locations, Hap Camp, Wairika and Orleans, we span two counties. Kodak Tribe is the second largest tribe in California. And we've been here since time immemorial and we have been stewards of the Klamath River land since time immemorial. Dam removal will improve, improve uh, water quality and free up nearly 400 miles of spawning grounds for, for the salmon. The Klamath River is the lifeblood for the Kodak Tribe. We depend on the Klamath River culturally, spiritually, and in order to be healthy. And the Klamath River provides the Kuduk people with a very healthy food source, salmon, uh, eels, steelhead, etc. It's a place where we go to perform our, our ceremonies and, and say our prayers. Uh, Kudamin is uh, the place where the Kuruk tribe considers it the center of our world. It's a place where we have ceremonies and it's a place where the Kuruk tribal members go to do their uh, substance fishing, their, their dip net fishing, so they can uh, provide uh, a, a substance for families and for elders and uh, so in um, 2022, there was a massive fish kill and 60,000 plus salmon washed up on the shores of the Klamath River. And this was due to warm water temperatures and low flows. And the, the, uh, the dams on the Klamath River, the lowest dam on the Klamath River, they do not have any uh, over, uh, underneath 
release where the cold water, which is needed for the fish habitat, it's only over the top and it releases warm water, uh, which contributed to the, the fish kill. It also has a massive algae bloom that happens every year. And at one time there was uh, four times, 4,000 times the um, toxic release that was required by the EPA. So the um, uh, dam removal will uh, provide um, the, the, the cold water that is needed and uh, hopefully some more uh, added flows. So <laughs> one might ask about fires and what the fires have to do with uh, the water in, in the Klamath River. In, in uh, 2020, the Slater fire wiped out half the town of Happy Camp, again, the headquarters for the Karuk tribe. And when the uh, Karuk tribe and other, the indigenous people that lived along the river, they always used fire to reduce the fuels. And when that management practice was outlawed, the, the fuels grew up so thick that now there's high intensity burning. And when that happens, it burns right to the root uh, of, of everything. And it leaves massive scars on the landscape. So following the rain, uh, the fires, when the rains come, it uh, washes uh, massive amounts of, of mud into the river and it turns it very muddy, cutting off the oxygen supply for the salmon. That happened last year and it happened again this year with the McKinney fire. And again, during that process, thousands of fish were killed due to the lack of oxygen. So we, um, we want to be able to, uh, tribes need to be able to take the lead. They have knowledge of observation. The observation of well, the way mother nature did things for thousands of years. And that was passed on down from generation to generation and work in harmony with mother nature to let her do uh, the, the lightning strikes that caused the fires in the high country and let her clean the underbrush there. And, and the indigenous people here have always done the lower lands uh, burning to protect the communities for cultural uh, bear grass that need to be burned to make our baskets. Uh, many, many cultural reasons why we uh, burned the um, lower lands and, and kept them, um, the uh, fuels down. So as we move forward, uh, I, I think there is a need to educate our youth uh, and, and educate government officials about tribal ecological knowledge. Um, because the indigenous people along Klamath have managed our forests and our waterways for thousands of years, and it was successful. So as we move forward, uh, education is going to be a big part of it, educating our youth and educating other officials, working together to combine tribal ecological with modern science and make things better. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, and how, how profound your observations and to your point, you have been stewarded, stewarding this endeavor since time immemorial and the inflection of the idea that there is not inheritance to uh, mother earth and all that occupy her and that, that there has to be um, a continuation of those endeavors um, into next generations in order to protect and to preserve um, not only from an ecological perspective, but just um, from a cultural perspective and the preservation of those things that you hold so dear to your tribal nation and others. So thank you for those protections, the education process and the inherent education that has to go along with generations to come. Anishik. Uh, next, my question is for uh, Chairman James. Chairman James, uh, thank you for being here today. Could you please tell us a bit about the Yurok tribe and its relationship with the Klamath River and the impact these dams have had on your community and some of those obstacles that you have faced? Yeah, first of all, uh, thank you. Um, my name is uh, Joseph James, chairman of the Yurok tribe. 
We're located in uh, Northern California on the Lower Klamath River. I come from the village of Shregon, uh, also a traditionalist on our end, my end. Um, the, the Klamath River uh, and the Yurok tribe were, were a natural resource tribe. Uh, it's our life, it's our faith, it's our lifeway, uh, the meaning of, of the river for us. Uh, you know, we pray for balance, uh, to bring things back in balance, uh, 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 balancing ourselves, uh, taking care of the river, the river takes care of us. We have long, we've lived along the Klamath River since the beginning of time. Uh, regarding the creeks, the streams, the river, the ocean. You know, uh, we are fishing people, our life way, our faith, our spirit, all of all, all of all is around the Klamath River. Uh, as as uh, my brother there, Mr. Atterbury mentioned, uh, regarding the high country, we go into high country to pray, uh, give thanks for the creator, everything that he provides for us, and it is the Klamath River. Uh, the dams have have devastated our salmon runs. There are only three to five percent of our strip of salmon runs left. There's not a left salmon on the mainstream on the main on the on the mainstream of the Klamath River. Uh, the Canadian fishing life way. Uh, we had to cancel our York commercial fishing for nearly a decade. There are enough salmon to provide for our system needs of the York people. Uh, the Klamath River is sick, but we continue to move forward. Uh, on behalf of our people, our ancestors that did for everything for us to get us to this point. Uh, you know, it's a it's going to be a beautiful time when the dams come down. We have Cop Kodu coming down this year and the other three coming down next next year. It's the largest dam removal in the United States history. Uh, and the Europe tribe uh, could do it alone. We mentioned some of the obstacles. There was many obstacles we faced. These dams are located off the Europe reservation. Uh, within the Klamath Basin. Uh, they're located in two different states, Oregon and California. We could not move the dams on our own. We had to work with state officials, the power company, which owned the dams, and several NGOs. You know, it started out uh, one dam. Uh, you know, it's important to recognize the history when we started this 20 years ago. We talk about one dam, uh, tribal leaders before us. We always look back past, present, and the future in our way of life, even our culture, even our, our prayers. We always look back, current and in the future for our generation, our children to come. You know, we couldn't do this alone. Um, you know, uh, initially, the entities that I mentioned did not recognize our legal right for water to fish, and we had to exercise our inherent sovereignty on our reservation. They didn't understand the severity of the harm that dams are causing to our community. We had to prove existed and had to exercise our legal right. Dams rule took a very long time. We have always advocated for dam rule. Took nearly over 20 years to get to this point and implement a strategic plan to approve dam rule. It took money, roughly about 500 million. Uh, took political will. We had to build relationships with power companies, state and federal officials legal strategy. We had to win cases that required the power company to install fish ladders to renew the license to operate the dam. Economically, it was cheaper to remove the dams than to install fish ladders. You know, so uh, we have come a long way and we couldn't do it alone um, with our brothers and sisters in the basin, our, our state, our local regions, federal, state officials, California, Oregon. Uh, it's truly gonna be a historical moment not just with the Yurok tribe, but you know, the United States. We have come a long ways. Uh, we've lost life in advocating for this battle. Again, the, the river is important to us. It is our life way, it's our spirit. It, it provides balance to us and it's our job and oath um, to protect it. Again, as, as natural resources, as fishing people, uh, it's our diet, it's our store. It's our, everything we rely on for our culture, our basket materials. We use our canoes on the river for transportation. Uh, everything you do evolves around our, our river and our natural resource. As people, as indigenous people, as spiritual, as cultural people, as prayer people, uh, waking up every morning, uh, feeling the love and the spirit of, uh, uh, to be able to, to advocate and fight for our river, to thank the creator for allowing us to be here today, to pave the way, 
for us now and our children, seven generations down the road, to be able to walk the banks of the Klamath River and not have to wake up to, to deal with dams uh, to continue to fight for our salmon and our fish. But uh, thank you uh, for uh, bringing us forward and to have this discussion. So uh, thank you. Thank you, um, Chairman James. And for those to you and Chairman Atterbury, those important um, uh, reminders about the significance of water and what that means, not just to indigenous communities, but to the world and how much indigenous people have to teach the world about stewardship and cultural ways, but also knowing that just anatomically, the, the human body consists of 60% water and, and water is life. And once that resource is depleted or compromised, it can't be reproduced and how critically important that is just not to save the Kalamath River, but to teach the world about the significance of stewardship and the intercultural connection that you have expounded on. You know, it's so important to all of us. And, and also to your point, um, the strategy of how to, how to steward it through your political uh, endeavor as somebody who is not just as indigenous, a, a, an indigenous body, but a political body also, which many people don't understand as tribal nations, the unique relationship that they have um, as government to government and somebody who self-governs, but also the navigation to your point of in employing and advocating beyond just the borders of your respective ceded territory, that it's everybody's job and something that we should all critically care about. So thank you so much for that, Chairman James, and those important reminders. Um, next, we have with us a, um, Danielle Ray Frank. Uh, Ms. Frank, um, thank you for, so much for being here today and providing your perspective, especially from um, you know uh, a youth perspective. Could you please provide us with some context to the environmental impacts these dams have had on the Klamath River, its ecosystems and the surrounding lands, and what you believe to, the, to, to are the effects that these dams could have on salmon populations? Yeah, definitely. Um, so first, I do want to thank Chairman James and Chairman Atterbury. Um, like I said, this I was born around the start of this revolution to undam the Klamath River. It's something that my family's been very involved in since the day it started with my uncle Howard McConnell um, working on the Klamath Dam removal during his chairmanship with the Yurok tribe and my father taking me to protest in a stroller. So just um, growing up watching this, I watched this river die before my own eyes growing up. And I always heard the stories from my elders of the way it's supposed to be, the salmon that we're supposed to have. But in my lifetime, that's not something that I've ever actually got to see. Yet somehow I still feel like it. I know what it's supposed to be like. I know that we're supposed to be able to feed ourselves from this river. And this uh, campaign, the climate dam removal, is what inspired me to become a scientist and go into environmental science to be able to understand what these people were talking about when they were giving me all of these reasons why the salmon were dying, I just couldn't understand it. And so that's why I'm trying to figure out the way the world works from a Western science perspective, because this, these things, these disasters just don't make sense from a traditional perspective. I'm gonna take us through some of the impacts um, and the, the environmental impacts that have been had through this campaign. And I, while I do that, I think it's very important that we all keep in mind, like, like both chairmen said, that our people of the Klamath River Basin are intrinsically intertwined with the way that this water flows and with the health of this river. So as the health of this river has declined, so has the health of our people. The, the disastrous environmental impacts this hydroelectric project has had on our homelands is extremely apparent. It started over a century ago when Copco One went up, blocking over 300 miles of vital salmon and steelhead habitat in the main stem of the Upper Klamath and its tributaries, meaning that this 300 miles was no longer accessible for salmon populations within the Klamath River Basin, and not get it completely wiped salmon populations from having access to the Upper Klamath Basin tribes like the Klamath tribe. And today, after completion of all of the six dams belonging to this project, that number sits even higher. I believe it's around 400 miles of the river, which is now inaccess inaccessible to salmon populations. And that's something that will be changing in the next few years. 
Um, this has greatly diminished the, product the productivity of the Klamath River and all of its tributaries. It's blocked spawning grounds and it's blocked off cold source water, causing to heat up the water. Uh, and beyond last loss of habitat, the Iron Gate Dam, one of the largest, now serves as kind of a giant heat sink that creates major water quality problems. This is including the toxic algae blooms that one of our chairmen was able to touch on. Most of these dams are a major breeding ground for a cyanobacteria. This is a substance that looks like kind of a blue-green algae that's a little thicker and it's toxic to all life existing within the Klamath River Basin, which does put all of our lives at risk considering how intertwined with these rivers we are. If you come to our home, you will see that our ancestral villages are built directly above the banks of these rivers. We built our lives around this, these rivers because they hold everything that we're supposed to have access to in order to simply survive. And so this substance, this blue-green algae is something that has been in the river almost every year since I've been born. It's something that you get on the local news, this big notification of to stay out of the river because it, the side effects could be sickness, they could be illness, and they could even be death in certain cases for simply trying to be in our ancestral territories in these spaces that are supposed to provide for us. Um, I know that Chairman Atterbury mentioned the Kodu tribe in the recent past, how they've measured a climate toxicity content that exceeded the World Health Organization's guidelines by over 4,000 times. So what is healthy? We are 4,000 times past unhealthy. Beyond the loss of habitat, and the unlivable water quality. The salmon don't stand much chance with these dams in place. The current river fall Chinook salmon productivity is now less than 8% of its histor historical abundance. For coho salmon, which was pretty much the working horse of the Western, of the Western coast back in the day, the numbers are now less than 1% of what we're supposed to have and what we did have. And I think in order to truly understand the disaster these dams have caused, we really need to understand how the Klamath River once existed. So just to keep into context, it was once the third most productive salmon river on the West Coast with runs above 1 million per year. We have now less than 8% of those coho and 1% or less than 8% of those coho and 1% of those, or 8% of the Chinook, 1% of the coho, I'm sorry. Um, and you know, just keeping in mind that we're supposed to have over a million fish a year. Our people are supposed to be eating this. We're supposed to be gathering this. This is how our people were self-sufficient and stayed healthy in order to, there was a study done in the past that went and spoke about pre-dams that our people were supposed to be eating 400, approximately 450 pounds of salmon each per year. That was our main food source. In 2005, the study said that that number had dwindled down to almost five pounds per person, leaving us with 1.1% of the nutrients that salmon provide, that the teachings that salmon provide. And so keeping in context, this isn't just a river that's dying. This is something that's, that's contributing to modern day indigenous genocide. You know, diabetes runs high in our communities. Substance abuse runs high in our communities because we're not able to live the way that we're supposed to. Our diets are not allowed to be indigenous because we simply don't have the resources for it. We don't have what we need in order to keep our people healthy. And that's constantly contributing to the death of our people. You know, like Chairman James said, we've lost people in this fight. Uh, my father was largely involved in this and he really inspired me and I lost him before he got to see these dams come down. So this is something that, you know, while we talk about the declining health of a river, the declining health of a community, we really need to be focusing on the declining health of the populations and the people within these communities. I know something that's been you know, widely um, noticed by uh, that I've noticed pretty recently with westernized science is that it's always very transactional, in my opinion, we're talking about these rivers and these places and all of these percentages, but not often do we touch on the people. And so I think that's something that we can really take into consideration with this panel is the way that the, the health of our people has declined with the health along with the health of this river. And, you know, one thing that I want to end with is that for when I don't think I know that it's not always going to be like this. Like I said, my father didn't get to see the river either in all of its prime. He was born after the dams. 
but in the future, my children will be able to see this river without all of these problems. My hope is that, you know, they'll be eating 200 pounds of salmon a year and that they'll be able to gather those teachings and that health that comes along with making sure that our lifeline is healthy. And so just being able to, you know, know all the stories from my ancestors of way how of the way that things are supposed to be and to see my dad fighting for that so hard and to grow up and spend the rest of my life trying to figure out how to fix this is just um, something that is, you know, really, really shows the way that Native people will fight till the end for what we believe in. It's not been a 20 year fight. It's been a fight since the day those dams were put in and we finally won. And so these dams are gonna come down, the fish are gonna go home. And I think that's something that I really wanna celebrate during this panel is the way that the things are going back to the way that they're supposed to be. And that is because of tribes leadership and like Chairman James said, the only way that we're going to really restore this place in the future is by giving tribes leadership within these regions. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, you. Thank you, Danielle. And um, what a critical reminder. I, I love your fierce advocacy and the, the notion that you will no longer accept the things you cannot change. You will change the things that you cannot accept because you see it as intergenerational and necessary. And to your point, that call to action is, is very profound when you're saying that it's 4,000 times less unhealthy. And there's statistics and data to, you, to to your point. It's not just transactional. It's about the quality human life that is produced by stewarding and doing things that are inherent of us. And to Chairman James and Atterbury's point of how we steward this, and it, it is a matter of life and death, right? And it's not just fodder. It's not just statistics. It's so much inherently ingrained in our culture and your your dietary needs and how we can endeavor forward in a healthy and meaningful way. And, and the fact that you're giving homage to not only your dad, but to your ancestors is so critically important. And you're marrying that with science and you're taking that science from a cultural perspective and a Western perspective and marrying it so that you can find a way to steward and protect that aligns with your core principles. So thank you so much for that, Daniel. Very impressive. So next we have with us is a question for Assistant Secretary Connor. Assistant Secretary Connor, we sincerely appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. And um, so can you share some insights or provide us with some um, insight regarding the relationships between tribal nations of the Klamath River and the federal government in your combined efforts to have these dams taken down? And then finally, how might other tribes or even advocates learn from this ongoing partnership in order to implement similar strategies, not only in their own environmental sovereignty efforts, but just collectively and globally? President Holsey, thanks for having me. Thanks to you and then CAI for pulling together this uh, great panel. There's an old saying that uh, those folks are hard acts to follow, uh, but they're not acts. It's authentic uh, understanding of everything that's happened in that basin. So you're, you're hard, authentic figures. Uh, and I'm honored to be here uh, to uh, participate in this panel with you all. Uh, I was actually at the UN yesterday in New York participating in a panel that was a thematic session on water and disasters. Uh, so of course, we were trying to learn from disasters and apply it, uh, but it was pretty sobering. So to be here on this panel to talk about an accomplishment of this significance, large scale restoration, uh, of which is meaningful from an environmental standpoint, but more important for its benefits to uh, tribes, their rights and their cultures. And I love the uh, title, Restoring Rivers, Restoring Sovereignty, because uh, um, Sovereignty means nothing if you don't have the resources that are the basis for the culture uh, that uh, Native people have long relied on. So uh, that's a long-winded uh, intro to get to your question, uh, which is, or questions, and I'll probably talk about it in, in a combined way. Um, you know, what, what was the nature of the relationship and what were those aspects that helped to make this a successful partnership between the tribes and the federal government? And I will say that uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, I think the reason I'm on this panel is notwithstanding my role with the Army Corps um, these days, I was the uh, commissioner of the Bureau of Reclamation 
uh, at the time of the negotiations leading to the Klamath Dam removal. So I was responsible for Secretary Salazar, the negotiations that led to the agreements. Uh, and so my interactions, and, and particularly as a Native American myself, I'm a member of Taos Pueblo in New Mexico, uh, it was very, very important to establish a good relationship at the beginning of the Obama administration because the relationship had been very, very poor. Um, you know, litigation, constant, uh, you know, set of issues, major fish kill with no real action in the aftermath of the fish kill to try and address uh, issues back in the early 2000s. Um, and so from that standpoint, I will admit that started to turn around um, uh, late in the Bush administration um, with Secretary Kempthorne, who opened the dialogue that led to the Klamath uh, Dam removals, and that was very significant. So uh, uh, kudos to uh, Secretary Kempthorne. But I think some of the aspects of the relationship that are really important is uh, we established lines of communication early. Uh, I think we were, from the tribe's perspective, given the benefit of doubt that we wanted to change uh, the direction with respect to issues on the Klamath River. Uh, and that, so it was a kind of a trust but verify situation. And so there were a number of things that we could work on. I think one aspect is we all had a similar ultimate goal, recognizing that the value of those dams on the Klamath River serve very little purpose in today's age, given the impacts uh, and the costs associated with those dams that Danielle outlined so well, uh, and that the, the two chairmen uh, indicated the importance of the resources. So uh, we knew they had little beneficial value from a power generation standpoint, given the impact that they were having. Uh, so we all wanted to get to that point, but there were lots of other issues. You know, there were issues about, you know, never providing flows for boat dance, uh, for historical underfunding of the Trinity River Restoration Program. Uh, for not working with the Klamath tribes on their land issues. And I think we took a collective approach working with the tribes, not just to look at the Klamath River and how might we get to a situation where we can uh, get dam removal, but also working on all those other uh, issues with the tribes. So I think we built uh, a lot of trust in that process. Uh, that we were not just looking at dam removal, we were looking at a whole collective set of issues that were very important to the tribes overall. Um, and I think one other aspect of that is that required lots and lots of communication, uh, not just you know through our local and regional representatives. Uh, I can't even tell you how many meetings I had with the tribal chairs, with uh, them being in D.C. with how many times I was out on each of the reservations uh, during the course of the Obama administration trying to work through issues. And that lines of communications were very important because even as we proceeded towards dam removal, uh, this was incredibly complicated. We started with two historic agreements in 2010 that had been negotiated over three or four years, which were uh, the hydropower settlement agreement, which was intended to have Congress authorize dam removal, uh, as well as the climate based and restoration agreement, uh, which was to ensure that in doing dam removal, improving the health of the river, that we were taking care of the agricultural interests, that we were doing, uh, looking at the upper basin, we were taking a basin wide approach, uh, addressing the issues with the refuges. Um, and of course, as we know, we signed those agreements, we celebrated that in 2010, and then Congress never acted on those agreements. So how do you, you know, get over that disappointment, pick up the pieces and decide what's your next round? That was very difficult. Uh, but I think once again, because of the communications we established uh, and the trust that had been building, uh, ultimately we got to a point where uh, we found another way to move forward without congressional authorization required because FERC had that authority. Uh, in the license issuing process, they can decommission facilities. And we restructured the agreements uh, with the tribes uh, by our side, uh, not only from their uh, indigenous knowledge, scientific knowledge, but also their support as advocates. Uh, and that collective, we do what we can as federal officials, the tribes can do that 
with Congress, they can do it in the media, they can do it from a science perspective, they can do it in the local communities. Uh, and it was just a synergistic, um, I think, relationship that it built over time that uh, led to that uh, ultimate success that hopefully will uh, result in the uh, groundbreaking or the dam breaking that uh, we anticipate uh, later this year. So it's, it's communication, it's strong relationships, it's a demonstrated commitment through a whole array of actions, uh, and it allows for tough decision, tough discussions to be had uh, for a common and ultimate long-term goal. And those were, I think, what happened in the Klamath. I think uh, those aspects relate to other resource issues for tribes and other situations. Uh, and I think that's part of the lessons learned uh, in this situation. Thank you, Assistant Thank Secretary you, Assistant Connor. Secretary to, your Connor point, to your point, it is about, it is about effective communication and collaboration, but it's also about the enjoyment to the complexity of what you're discussing and the interconnectedness that um, involves many different parties from not only just tribal nations to state, local, and, that, and our federal partners. And this is a perfect example when, um, when that collaboration takes place and that, that advocacy and that commitment when good things can happen. Um, and so thank you for that because we need people like you in the administration to help navigate that so that there's a continuation of this effort to steward and to protect. So thank you so much for that perspective and, and your service to Indian country. Um, with that said, um, I just wanna, I know that we're very short on time here, but Ms. Frank, Assistant Secretary Connor, Chairman Atterbury and Chairman James, this is your final question and um, for today. And we, we're just kind of, um, we wanna sort of explore some of your key takeaways um, that you have from decades and your longstanding battles over restoration of the Klamath River and as expounded even um, previous our ancestors and their stewarding. What advice do you have for other indigenous leaders or advocate, advocates um, attending this panel um, in their own efforts towards the United Nations Water Conference interactive dialogue on the water for climate resilience and environment. What kind of takeaways would you all provide our audience today about some of the, the, the things you'd like to share with them in their own endeavors? Ms. Frank, how about we start with you? Yeah, I can definitely start. Um, you know, my biggest takeaway from this, like I said, the Climate Down campaign kind of started the rest of my life. And I think the biggest takeaway that I've had over all of my years of research um, for school and for my personal use and for work is just understanding that nothing is impossible. You know, as Indigenous people, we inherently know what is right for the places that we exist within. For our river basin, it, the Klamath or the Klamath tribe, the Hoopa tribe, the Yurok and the Karuk tribe all understand what this place is supposed to be and how it's supposed to exist. And I think that the biggest takeaway I have is to just know that it will return to that nomad. Like if then you're going to get told the, no 150 times, but that one time you get told yes, it might just change the entire world. And so one thing that I've learned from this campaign and from people like Chairman James and Chairman Atterbury, hearing them speak, seeing their work in my community, listening to my father and my elders, is just understanding that we will fix this place and that we will make it to something closer to something that it's supposed to be. You know, this so this this entire country, the way it is, exists, has only existed like this for about 200 years. Our homes have existed like this for thousands and thousands of years. And so just understanding that you know, there's there's gonna be a million ways to go at things, but just knowing in your heart that you're going towards the right thing, always listen to your elders, always listen to those who came before you and you know, make sure that you take that time to listen to your elders. I've learned more from the people in my community than I'll learn from getting my PhD. It, that those are the people who know more about these places than a book could ever, ever teach me. And so making sure that I'm holding the knowledge that I can receive from my community at a higher level than almost anything. That's my, that's my pilot light. That's what I work towards, you know, as some, as my future as a tribal scientist, I will continue to take traditional ecological knowledge um, in and listen to my elders and make sure that 
that's what I'm working towards. I'm not working towards a smaller budget. I'm not working towards, you know, a compromise where some fish might die and things might not be great, but they'll be better. I'm working towards something that my elders saw so that my kids can see that and know that that's always possible. You don't always have to compromise. You don't always have to, you know, the the budget will, you'll figure out the budget, you'll figure out the plan. It will come, just make sure that you're you're holding strong in what you're fighting for. And even if it does take 20 years in a courtroom, they will come true. Thank you so much for those profound words, um, Danielle, and your advocacy. I, you know, you encouraged me and you inspired me and our future is bright with advocate, fierce advocates like yourself. Thank you so much. How about you, Assistant Secretary Connor? I've got uh, uh, four takeaways that I'll really quickly lay out. Um, first, and I think you've heard this from uh, all the tribal leaders, uh, relationships and coalitions matter. Uh, and so it's not, wasn't just the federal tribal relationship. It all started, I think, in the basin based on the historical conflict between the different communities within the Klamath Basin and the decision by leaders uh, in those communities to talk to one each other one another because this wasn't working for anybody. So that started, you know, a dialogue that I think ended up being pretty productive and then surviving some of those challenges that we faced even after we had the initial uh, agreements. Um, and then coalitions, uh, that built a coalition where you could bring in external entities uh, to join in that effort. Uh, and that was really important because at the end of the day, this is dam removal. So even with the broad support, it had naysayers and it had opposition. Uh, and so you needed those relationships in the, in the coalition to get through that. Um, second, um, uh, I don't mean this to be political, but administrations matter. Uh, and it's really important, uh, even when you're looking towards a long-term goal of how do you advance this when you have uh, administrations, leaders like President Obama, President Biden, who have clearly laid out to everybody in their administration Tribal rights uh, are a priority. Uh, go out and do good things, and it gives a license. Uh, and so setting yourself up to make those advances at a time uh, when you have those windows of opportunity uh, are really important. And I will just say, even in other administrations where the leadership doesn't say that, you'll always find people uh, that advance those interests within the administration because they recognize the importance. So, I'm trying to back off being overly political uh, with respect to that. Uh, three, science, policy, and law still matter. So even if you have you know, support, and even if you have folks in an administration who want to work with you towards an end goal, you got to make the case. Uh, from a policy perspective, those dams made no sense whatsoever. 160 megawatts of power, but they were only operated by 80. That's easily replaceable. And the destruction that they caused, as once again, Danielle laid out, uh, it was a no-brainer from a policy perspective. Treaty rights, uh, everything else thrown in. We still had to make the case because I guarantee I was in, you know, five, six, seven hearings in 2010 and 2011 where I was getting attacked for how dare you be advocating that this is a, a good thing to do to remove these dams. Um, and then lastly, I just said, keeping, keeping an eye on the long term. Uh, as we've heard, this is 20 years in the making uh, before it really started to get going, and it still took 20 years. Uh, but the good news is that we know uh, you got to have your eye on the prize and, and work through all these issues. But there will be dam removal and there will be restoration. Everywhere we've done this, whether it's the Elwha, whether it's Condit on the White, we see Mother Nature remarkable in how it restores itself. Uh, so there will be large runs. Uh, this will be a wonderful accomplishment uh, for those seven generations from here on out. But thank you for everybody for all the work that was put into getting us to this point. Indeed, Indeed. Assistant Secretary, and, and it is right. Uh, grandmother certainly needed that reprieve, right? It's much to celebrate, but to your point, so much work to do. You know, we sort of have to keep our foot on the gas because we know that this precious is resource and at risk and, and it re requires everybody's collaboration and interconnectedness because it's everybody's job. So thank you for those important reminders. How about you, Chairman James? Yeah, thank you again. Um, you know, keep advocating, 
keep fighting for your way of life. Uh, uh, you know, uh, never stop advocating uh, for who who you are as a as a person, as Indigenous people. Your rights, um, your your inherent right uh, as a sovereign nation, but also as as a person. Um, you know, uh, continue to find partnerships and opportunities that merge Indigenous and business and using traditional um, illogical knowledge and needs. Um, you know, as a uh, you know, what we're pushing here at Yurok, uh, tribes, Yurok tribes, indigenous people, uh, you know, we're not going nowhere. We've been here since the beginning of time, uh, whether it's partnerships, uh, policy, co-management, um, opportunities. Uh, the system's not going to change overnight, over a year, uh, but we're not going nowhere. And again, any way, an opportunity to include uh, indigenous people in, in policy, in, in, in structure, ordinance, uh, management, uh, regarding our way of life and needs here, uh, we're, we're pushing that. Continue to use your legal rights, um, you know, whether it's your treaty rights, your treaty rights, or your Federal Reserve rights, uh, you know. So those are the tools that we utilized uh, to help protect our our river and for our way of life. And so again, as a for a close, uh, Mayan, I again I want to thank our, our tribal leaders, past, current. I want to thank our tribal elders. I want to thank our our our, our, our water protectors, men and women, our, our our cultural practitioners, and our our state and federal agencies in Oregon, in California, in the United States. Uh, you know, as, as a team effort to, to get to this point, it was a long road. Uh, as a uh, assistant secretary mentioned, the uh, the work now is uh, we're already shifting gears on restoration. Now we got to heal the basin uh, for the next. X amount of years, uh, we're, we're ready for that though. Uh, a lot of work has to be done to bring the salmon back. And again, we talk about balance. That's what we're doing. We wake up, we balance ourselves as individuals. Uh, the river's taken care of us, creator has taken care of us. And now it's our job uh, to continue to advocate and fight. And so thank you. Thank you for those important and critical reminders and just giving thanks to those that became before us and all the work and the reminder as indigenous people against all odds and the obstacles we've faced since time immemorial, we're still here and we ha all have a purpose intended driven um, agenda that we have to do in order to protect future, future generations. So thank you for that chairman. Uh, chairman Atterbury, how about you? Yeah, thank you again. Um, so, um, Assistant Secretary Connor and Chairman James both touched on it a little bit, but um, I, I think uh, being a former educator, I think for the for the future of our, our youth, our children, our, our next generations of, of creating uh, uh, sustainability for the next generations. And in, in order to do that, we need to approach it with an ecology first um, mentality. Uh, when um, the, the logging projects and the mining projects and uh, forestry projects came before, it was always economy first. There's a sustainable economy out there, but we have to think ecology first because without our ecology, we won't have any economy. So restoration projects, um, forest restoration projects. Um, there's always a myth that the Kurok tribe was against logging. We weren't against logging. We were against the way it was being done that they, when they built roads in, they covered over the creeks and streams that, that uh, were tributaries to our rivers. Uh, the, the proper uh, restoration projects would be to enhance those streams, to clean those streams, to put in culverts to provide better flow for them streams. Uh, water conservation efforts. Uh, again, Assistant uh, Secretary uh, touched on the idea of uh, agriculture. And, and that is a viable commodity and we do not want to see that go by the wayside either. So can we create a uh, water uh, conservation projects that will um, store water, winter capture winter water. We won't go into all the things that we could do, but we need to get together and sit down together, uh, do the administrative work and figure out what these water conservations efforts will be so we don't have to divert water out of our rivers that that, that lower the, the flows so much that our fish can't get up there, that I, they can't spawn there. 
that our reds are exposed and destroyed. So those type of things are going to be the key for our future and for our next generations. And that's where we need to think is what are we going to leave for our children? Thank you. Very profound, Chairman Atterbury. And thank you for always being that educator, right? Because once you're an educator, you're always an educator and those important reminder, reminders beyond just, okay, now that we've accomplished that goal, that there is so much more education that has to take place as we continue to steward and to preserve. And then what are our plans and how do we collaborate? And I just I just wanna thank the panel today. Coincidentally, today is World Water Day. You know, and so thank you for sharing and bringing a, a important awareness around the global water crisis, but also sharing your success and what that means. And to all of your points, it wasn't something that happened overnight and it was something that required active engagement, um, inclusion, collaboration, and effective communication and education. You know, and these panelists certainly have demonstrated the importance of this, the need to steward um, our water, to protect, to restore, and to spread awareness of these current water issues that we have today, and to make sure that we keep apprised uh, of the challenges that we have moving forward with all of the threats that we face every single day as not only indigenous communities, but uh, as a larger landscape of the world. And this amazing panel and how they have been so innovative and creative in navigating that complex system. I just wanna say a huge Anishik um, uh, for all the work that you do and the lessons and the re important reminders that you provided today. I so appreciate you being with us today and everything that you've done and will continue to do. And so um, we will make sure that um, there will be follow back. Um, please, these tribal nations are always, um, and our leaders, and when I say that, I mean you, Danielle, and Assistant Secretary, and all the work that you do. It's critically important to all of us. And I, I just want to thank everybody for being here today and sharing their perspective and the important work that all of you do. And so with that said, I think that concludes our panel today. And so um, thank you for joining us. And be well, everybody, and continued success to all of you. Anishik.